I'm here with Colin. He's uh, obviously one of our resident makers, and I know a lot of you out there are uh, thinking about getting into welding at home, and you always ask, hey, can I do that at home? The answer to that is absolutely yes. I'm gonna take you through a couple of the fundamentals that uh, you need to know. We're gonna get Colin up and running, and we're gonna see what kind of beads we can get him to burn today. That's right, we gotta learn the basics today. We're just gonna start at the beginning. So Randy, what are we wearing? Rule number one, Colin works with hot metal all day long. He knows what hot metal will do. Now, when Colin's hammering, you wear leather. Yes. It's leather. okay to wear leather. Actually, some welders will wear leather. We're gonna wear a FR rated jacket. Uh, it stands for fire resistant. Um, I happen to be sporting the BSX flame model. Colin's got on a Lincoln. We have those here for you when you come in as a craftsman at first build. Sometimes when you pull the trigger on a gun, you're gonna get a little ball of fire that pops up in the air. You see him doing this numbers because it went down underneath your neck. He's got it all tucked up there nice and tight. Mid gloves are important. Mid gloves, I love the Tillman 55Ls. I had them for years. Mid gloves have some extra padding in them. They're not just regular leather gloves. Colin, are those same gloves you wear when you're forging? Uh, yes, Very sir. similar. Nice big leather gauntlets. Yes, absolutely. So. Anytime we're around heat, we want leather. We want to protect ourselves. So he's got his gloves on, I got my gloves on. Last but not least, we got to protect our eyeballs. When we're actually MIG welding, we're going to get some strong, strong light coming off of there. We need to filter that light out with a hood. Make sure you spend money, get you a good helmet. Setting wise, how do I know what to set it? This thing goes from 9 to 13. It goes from light to dark. We're going to set ours on 10. Make sure every time you pick up a helmet that you check that number or you're gonna get a bright flash. Somebody could have turned it down. So I always look at my number to make sure I'm on 10. He's got yep, his on 10. We go. We're gonna put that on. Here we got our fancy uh, MIG gun holder, compliments of Jimbo's Garage. Um, I've got some, uh, some angle iron today. We're gonna start out by doing a simple lap joint. Do you know how to set that up? Well, let's go over here and I'll show him how to set this up. 3 16th material, so we're gonna run 18,250. Somewhere in the 18,250 okay. range, right? Now, 50. what is 18,250? That's 18 volts, 250 inches a minute on the wire speed. Okay. Go ahead and set yourself up for 18 volts and 250 All inches right. a minute. And 250 on the wire speed. Before we run our first bead, Get yourself a good pair of these too. About $15 on Amazon, this is a pair of MIG pliers. MIG pliers serve three purposes. Somebody here always fails to clean the nozzle out on the gun. Right. And what happens when you have a dirty nozzle, Randy? When you have a dirty nozzle, you can't get gas out. It's hard to pass gas when you got a dirty nozzle. So we're gonna clean that nozzle out. These pliers actually have a set of serrated teeth on it. We're gonna knock all that out. Now, Randy, we use gas with these MIG welders. Now, what does the gas do for us? Great you know, question. What do you need gas to melt steel together for? When we go to join or weld metal together, we're actually going to turn it into a liquid. We're going to run gas out of this bottle back here. That is what we call 7525 argon CO2 mix. We need an environment over top of that weld joint that is free of oxygen. Um, the oxygen causes some issues with that metal when it's in its molten state. They make a style of MIG called flux core. The shielding is in the center of the wire and it's in the form of a cellulose that actually will burn while you're welding. And as that cellulose burns, it creates that environment. Flux core is just like stick welding outside. You'll see people building bridges, they're using stick welder. Flux core, same way, except you're gonna feed the wire instead of holding a rod when you're right. burning. A lot of the, the beginner hobbyists at home will buy a flux core welder. It's very inexpensive. I actually built a five foot by 10 foot trailer that I still own today and I built it completely with flux core. We're gonna, we're gonna do shielded gas MIG today. MIG just stands for metal inert gas. We talked about the inert gas, let's talk about the metal. The metal's gonna come down the end of this gun and you go, well, where's it coming from? Um, it's actually being pushed from the other end, so let's go over the other end and look at where that wire's coming from. So what Colin's going to learn to weld on today is our Lincoln Power MIG 256. Where does the wire come from out the end of the machine? If I pull the trigger, you're going to see the wire advancing out the end of the gun. Well, that wire is being fed from inside. This spool originally when it started was full of this wire and we're down to our very last bit. So we're going to have to change that out before we get started. What happens is when I pull the trigger, these two drive rolls will actually pull the wire and they're pushing it down the center of this gun and out the end. 
Now it's electrically conductive, so when I'm welding, I'm actually transferring globlets of, of metal through the arc that we're uh, creating by doing the, uh, by pulling the trigger and creating a weld joint. So that's how a MIG runs. All MIGs are the same way. All of your MIG machines, they'll have a tension bar and two sets of drive rolls. We're gonna just pull this wire all the way out. Now don't lose the end of this wire or it's gonna spring free. So hold on to it tight. We're gonna feed it down the center. You're gonna see it come out over here. Now once you get it fed through, you can see it's traveling in that little small groove in the drive rollers. There's a matching groove in the upper drive roller, so when I close this down, it's gonna trap it in between there, and that's what's actually gonna push it, so we'll lock that in. I'm gonna turn my wire speed way up so it goes really fast. It's traveling through the wire right now. So we're gonna take our MIG pliers, we're gonna snip that off, and now we are good to go. So now we're re-threaded. There are actually two more things that this set of MIG pliers will do for you. Sometimes these are very hot or they've been torqued in pretty hard. We use the MIG pliers to actually twist this tip loose that you can uh, put a new tip on. Now what I think I'll do is, since we're going to learn how to weld today, let's start out with a new tip. For this particular Lincoln, they do a really nice job of putting your consumables inside a little tray on top. Here's what an older one looks like, here's what a new one looks like. So. The wire's gonna pass through that little hole in the end. That's where it's gonna get its conductance from and actually create the weld joint. So we're gonna feed that back over the end. And then I'm gonna tighten it into the end of the gun just like that. We're not, we're not doing pipe fitting here. I just wanna snug it up so that it stays. This is where our gas is actually gonna come out. So it's traveling down the inside and in, down the center of the torch. It's gonna come out of these holes. And then it's gonna travel down here and that's what creates my shield. So there's our cover. If you cannot get the nozzle off, these have the ability to do that. So they've given you almost every function in a pair of MIG pliers that you would need to service this machine. All right, so we're getting ready to weld. I got my clamp on the table. Let's talk a little bit about technique. Colin, are you a pusher or a puller? Uh, well, whatever one's best. I'm not real sure. You're the master, you tell me. I'm a puller. So I'm actually gonna start my weld bead on this side and lay my gun over, and I'm gonna walk from left to right. There are pushers that will actually run the gun the other direction and they'll push and they'll leave the weld joint behind and they're always looking at where they're going and they're not looking at where they've been. I don't like pushing. If I'm not doing a good job of welding, I'm not gonna know that till I get done and I look back and I go, wow, that wasn't very good. When I'm pulling, I can actually see what I've created and where I'm going because I've got about this much of the joint sticking out and I can actually follow that. I suggest when you weld, you do whichever way is comfortable. If you want to do both, that's fine. Uh, but I am going to drag as I go. That's just a technique I developed. How do I approach my weld joint? So I'm getting ready to set up. I'm going to weld two pieces of metal. How do I do it? We're going to get up to the table now. Comfort. I like to come up to the table like I'm approaching a bar and having a drink. So oh, I've got okay. this, I run up to the table, you know, this is not a, we're not gonna stand back and shoot this thing like we're shooting a gun. We're gonna walk up to the table and get comfortable, laying down on one foot. I'm gonna turn the work to a 30 degree angle so that I can work my way across the table. That's my comfortable motion. Why do we have these thick gloves on? I'm gonna set my hand down on the table and I'm gonna, see how this gun's got a curve in it? Yes. So I'm going to lay it, this is how I was taught, I'm going to lay it across my hand. I can now manipulate the back end of this gun and work the tip anywhere I need right. to go. You created your own pivot point. Absolutely, really. right here. Now, as we're welding, all this heat's going to want to come back here and burn the back of my hand. Very important that you got extra protection on the back side. That's why I said earlier, don't wear a normal glove. A leather glove, it helps, but only for like the first 10 seconds, then it's going to get really hot. Right. So. Uh, and you know by handling hot metal, by the time you feel it inside the glove, it's too late. It's too late. One last thing we need to cover before we run our bead. We call this stick out. Mm -hmm. See the wire sticking out? They call it stick out. When we're welding, we want to be about the diameter of the nozzle away from the work. Okay, nice but, and close. Nice and close, but not all the way down close. Now what's going to happen is when you pull your stick out back, it's going to start popping because that wire is gonna have resistance in it and it's actually gonna be blowing apart before it gets down into the, the spray transfer. So we want the right stick out. So I've cut the wire off about the length that we need for the proper stick out. 
I'm going to approach the weld joint and I'm going to pull the trigger. So, ready? Okay. Here we go. Cool. Here we go. Attack that side. Attack that side. Now, you hear that sound? Sounds like... Like bacon in the skillet. Perfect. That's the sound we're going for. We looked at the chart. We happen to know that 18250 is the perfect setting for this thickness of material. If you don't get that bacon frying sound, you've got to adjust. Now, there's charts online. We're going to show one on the screen right now. It'll tell you how to look at your weld and determine am I too hot, too slow, not enough wire speed, not enough voltage. So you'll be able to self-analyze. All right, you think you're ready? Yeah, so that didn't take long at all. No. The metal to heat up for it to stick to itself. Instantaneous. I mean, the minute the wire creates that arc, that arc is extremely hot. So it's gonna transfer that wire into that weld joint and melt that puddle. Now you're gonna get a puddle of, of almost the same color as your forgings. It's gonna be orange and that puddle's gonna form. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually slowly drag that puddle forward. Now we're gonna start with a lap joint. Um, a lap joint is one metal sitting on another metal. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually, gravity wants that puddle to fall to the bottom. Okay. So we're going to start our gun on the base material and we're going to work it up as we go so that we can make sure we got enough weld puddle up onto the, the other piece of metal, right? So we're going to take our gun, we're going to spend most of our time down below and then we're going to whip up and whip up. So I use the small cursive E technique. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of, we walk it up into the elevated metal and then back down into the puddle and up and then I just keep drawing so we just do swoops all the way through. Okay. They're not monster swoops. You just want to make sure you wash that weld puddle up to pick up this upper upper metal. So it's, all, it's almost like you're writing in cursive. Absolutely, but you know what I, I, I like to equate it to? This is, a, this is a fancy glue gun. If you've ever had a glue gun and you're running a bead of glue, if you've got the gun too sharp at an angle, you're not gonna get any glue up on the material that you're trying to, to, trying to join. Okay. So you wanna bring the gun in at the right angle and then make sure your weld puddle is thick enough to pick up that upper. Because that weld puddle is gonna wanna fall down as, your, as right. gravity wants to drag it. Let's give him the gun and uh, we're gonna shoot close-ups and we're gonna see how our blacksmith does welding metal. It's a lot, it's a lot of pressure. I'm here <laughs> with the welding champ. Yeah, yeah no. Nope. With everyone watching, so I will do my best. Holy cow, I think Colin's cheating. Look at that. That is awesome. <laughs> That is perfect. All right, let's. So I've let, got a little secret that Randy doesn't know. I was a welder for many years, so I'm going to let him teach me, but I'm going to also maybe teach him a few things. I don't know. We'll see. So if you look at Colin's weld, he did a wonderful job of speed. Look at the even spacing. You can see each time you move the torch forward, you can see a bump. That's perfect spacing. So normally your amateurs or first time welders, this will be very irregular. So if you've got this irregular and it doesn't look like a standard pattern, try it again. And just remember, it's all about, uh, it's all about constant speed. Um, don't get nervous and try to fly through here. If you go too fast, you're not gonna get a, a well bead that looks like that. And you're gonna go to your chart and go, oh wow, that tells me I'm going too fast. So really good. He's got a good amount of material above and below with a nice bulge in it. Um, Got just a little bit of undercut up top, but for what we're doing today, it's not a big deal. So just really good repetition on the torch here. Uh, you can see where the puddle ended. Um, you can see a little bit of the uh, discoloration from the underlying material coming through. So just an outstanding job in, in, uh, in, in speed and flow on that particular setting. So, All right, so Colin mastered the lap joint. The second most uh, common joint that you're gonna end up doing, we're gonna put him to the test here. He's gonna do a T-joint. We're gonna do a T-joint on an inside corner. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn this piece of angle iron up and we're gonna run a weld in a 45 or a 90 degree corner. So um, I'm gonna set this up. What's really nice is we're using the same thickness of metal so that you can pour the heat into the bottom and you can spend a little bit more time going up and down. Now, if you had a thinner material on top and a thicker one on the bottom, you gotta put more heat, just like you do when you're forging. You gotta put more heat into the base metal and less in the top or you're gonna blow all the way through. You got that? Well, let me ask you this. You're laying a bead 
into this corner. Do you do a continual bead and turn this 90 degree angle? Or do you come in, stop, restart, and go down? I actually go into the corner, stop. I go to the outside corner and bring it to together and let the puddle fuse at the middle. Okay. So, and some people will go through the corner. Really, it's depend on your technique. Um, I find it hard to get that corner turned. I like to push my puddle into the corner and push that puddle into the corner. Okay. We'll see how Colin decides to do it. He's going to do this. Like that. He's going to do this inside corner. And we're going to see how it looks. So. Let's set up and uh, rock and roll. You actually did a pretty good job. It could be better. It's beautiful though. It's good. It's good. Look, look. So once again, we're gonna step up here and we're gonna look at some key points. We're gonna look at uh, spacing, really good spacing. Uh, the apex of the hump is actually almost at a 45, so he's got a good walk between top and bottom through here, coming out the other side the same way. Um, I have done this quite a bit. It, there's lots of techniques, but the, the thing that's gonna help you the most is practice. So, with that being said, come to First Build and practice here. Absolutely. You know, get your practice in, get your reps in, and you're well to start to look great too. And I'm happy to teach. As long as we've got the time on a Saturday, I'm here. I love to teach welding. Um, come on down, we'll set you up. Come down, pull up a chair, run some beads. I'm happy to share what's good and what's bad. Colin's here an awful lot. I'm sure he can help yeah, as well. So, so on the next episode, we're gonna get into a little bit of, if you notice this material was all the same thickness. Well, you don't always have the luxury of having the same thickness material. What happens when you get into thin to thick and thick to thin, how are you gonna do that? What are out of position welds? Let's get into a little bit of that. Um, I'll bring my flux core in. I'll show you a little bit about flux core and some of the, uh, the techniques and tips of doing flux core. So stay tuned for episode two. We'll dive into some of the intricacies of MIG welding. So we'll call that MIG 102.